Welcome, everyone. I'm Professor Tansi Whalen, Director of NYU Stern Center for Sustainable Business. I'm thrilled to have join us today Bill McDonough, who is the CEO of McDonough Innovation, also a um, you know, sort of foremost thinker in circularity, designed and uh, came up with the idea of cradle to cradle, um, is a provocateur, is a muse, is a catalyst for action um, globally. I first met Bill. Uh, river rafting uh, on the West Coast with Walmart, <laughs> where we were all talking about sustainability as we dodged boulders while we were um, paddling down the river. Um, and he is really, as you will hear from him in our conversation, just a fascinating thinker and also beyond thinker, somebody who's really responsible for an enormous amount of action to help us move forward to a more circular, sustainable, and regenerative world. So, Bill, if I could invite you to, to uh, turn on your camera and come join us, that would be terrific. Great. Um, so uh, we will, um, uh, in a, the course of our conversation, um, we will be happy to take questions, which you can type into the Q&A. And toward the end of our session together, we'll save 15 or 20 minutes to um, tackle those questions with Bill. Um, we will also be sending you um, his most recent uh, book that he has um, developed on Cradle to Cradle and some of the concepts he'll be sharing with you today. So, Bill, um, as I mentioned earlier, we had first met 15 years ago. A lot has happened <laughs> since then for good and for ill. And I wonder if you could share with us, um, you know, your perspective of What's been happening in the world from a sustainability, circularity, and sort of, um, you know, sort of uh, where we've been and where we're going? It has been a long journey. Um, I think for me, the most important thing for this conversation is actually to think about our language, because I don't know that we have the right language. And when we get started on things, if you can't describe it or name it, it's hard to uh, en endorse it or engage it. You get distracted. So I'd say even on the term sustainability, we've seen it you know, since the 70s uh, with the Brundtland Commission and so on, the Club of Rome. And sustainability is now becoming relatively generic as a statement. It's hard to really know, are you referring to the way a business operates? Are you referring to a planet that's surviving? Is it maintenance? Is it thriving? Is it uh, circular? Is it regenerative? Everybody's using all these words, but I'm finding it difficult to, to really see us moving forward without re-examining our actual language. So, Here's some examples of how to think about language. We, in the 70s, 80s, life cycle assessment was developed. And so you now have people saying they're designing for end of life. And I get terrified whenever I hear phrases that frighten children. So can you imagine going home from work and, say, and they say, what were you doing today, daddy? And, and I say, I was designing for the end of life. Yeah, that's not going to work. Very good point. <laughs> yeah, so uh, I like to say design for interviews. And then you can ask the question, well, what's the next use? Because it's the obvious next question, literally and figuratively. So then you say, well, now I'm designing for next use. Welcome to the circular economy. Mm -hmm. okay. So that's really important. And um, hold on, somebody's trying to reach me here. I forgot to turn off. So I think the idea of designing for next use is important. And then if, if then it brings you to the question of utility and use. So, so sustainability isn't just maintenance. It's actually about thriving. And so we want to design in the systems that can grow. So I use the term regenerative biosphere. Because the biosphere is regenerative, it has sunlight, it has carbon from the atmosphere, it has sunlight. So we have that. And then we have 
the circular technosphere. So in cradle to cradle, we see materials as either biological nutrients or technical nutrients. Things that go back to nature or things that go back to industry. Mm -hmm. So there's a regenerative circle in nature and there's a circular circle mm -hmm. in industry. In industry see? So, so, and then, and their living things are in the regenerative biosphere. So designing for the end of life is when something is dead, but it's still a nutrient for the bio biome. Mm -hmm. And and so end of use is in the technosphere because these are materials designed for human purpose. So I find that helpful to people. And there's a lot more like that, that just how we can see things and speak about these things slightly differently. So I look at sustainability generally, and I refer to it as intergenerational stewardship. Mm -hmm. Because it's not just maintenance. It's actually growth. How do we improve things for yeah. our kids, right? And grandkids. Yeah. And, and I think your point around um, designing for end of use is, is really helpful. And, and, and we're seeing such fascinating, you know, so if I were to look at these last 15 years, as one example, you look at Renault, the car company, they are now designing their cars to be reused, right? So I think it's sort of 85% of the car is recyclable, recoverable. They've got 40 something percent um, old components going into new cars. Um, and there's just so much, but, but, they're, but they're the exception, not the rule, right? Um, and so there's a real opportunity, I think, for more and more um, companies to embrace this, this philosophy um, and focus and save money, make money while doing it, right? We, we looked at another company, an automotive company that was only um, reusing 2.5% of end of use um, vehicles and uh, recycling 10% of it. And they were making a, netting $100 million on it. But they they didn't know that because they were thinking about it as a compliance issue and not something that was actually really an opportunity, right, for, for design. So really interesting evolution and a long way to go, I imagine, too. Well, and, and there's a case where I, I remember people getting excited when it was Renault and others where in the, in the book, Cradle to Cradle, Michael Brown got and I described the idea of a car as nutrition. We call it the nurture vehicle. And we went through the notions that are there. One would be things that you don't really care about in terms of appearance or whatever, but performance can be maintained like a fuel cell or an engine. You, it's a black box, really. And so you can think of those as services. So you can pop them in and out and use them for different things. So design for next use is, is possible. But what, what you find then, so that's a quirky one, because people are saying, oh, isn't it great they're reusing their old engines as original equipment so they could put it out there again. And that's interesting. So the car can take the old engine blocks and they can clean them up and they can fix them and get them ready and get, the, get all the valves right. And cylinders and then put them back out and so they say isn't that great it's it's reuse and saves all this money and mining and whatever but it does beg another question underneath it all which is why are we doing this because if you think about it what you just did is perpetuate the life of an internal combustion engine for another 25 years oops is that your intention See, so you have to stop every time you do something and think, think about it. Is my intention to perpetuate burning gasoline? Right. Because I just come back from COP27, and we're trying to figure out how you stop fossil fuels. Yep. And everybody's trying to figure that out. I mean, even Saudi Arabia has said they want to go for net zero by date certain. So that's just license to practice for all of us. Let's go get that done. And so I would say, you know, looking at that, you, you want to ask yourself, is my intention to perpetuate gas burning? Because a lot of the oil companies will say, if you want us to stop selling oil, then stop making things that need oil because it's a demand, supply demand issue. So. What, what I think is super interesting about just in the car space as they convert to electric vehicles, which, you know, there's a set of issues associated with that, obviously, that we need to deal with. But um, there's far fewer component parts, right, okay. in an electric vehicle. And so because of that, if we are learning this sort of redesign, reuse on the traditional combustion engines, then 
being able to apply that same approach to an electric vehicle that has far fewer component parts is going to be a lot easier That's right. for us to design it that way from the beginning. That's right. Yeah, That's super right. interesting. But I would love to. So you brought up COP in climate. I, um, I wonder if you could share with us, you know, there's been, you know, I think people felt great. We've got um, some forward progress, but then not very much on the 1.5. So I'd love to get your feedback on, um, you know, wh- what your observations were of the COP, of, of the conclusions or the actions taken, what what we're still missing. What do you, what do you see hope? Where do you see concern? Well, I, I would say we, we really need to focus on how my generation, really, is the last generation to being silly and foolish around all this. We have to stop that. So I think we've come to grips with the idea that climate change is a horrifying prospect and that we caused it. So we have to face it. So I think, in a sense, the things I've seen at COP both here in Glasgow and so on, the fundamental issue for me is the, when people are marching in Glasgow, the young people, and their posters all said, we have no future. Good grief. And so that idea that, you know, like a memory, the future is a terrible thing to lose. <laughs> so if you think about it, losing the idea that the future could be better is a horrifying thing for us to leave the next generation. So I think, I think one thing that needed to happen and that's happening is that the goal of net zero that's everywhere is it's a legitimate thing to worry about when you've made a mess of things. So for all the people who want to be less bad, a goal of zero makes sense. I'll be zero bad. But the problem is it's still bad because bad is a human value. Less is a numerical relationship. So being less bad is not good. It is by definition bad, just less so. So I think the next generation needs to be introduced to the tools and the spirit of what is 100% fabulous look like. So they get to do that. Mm -hmm. We should definitely pursue net zero because we've made a mess of things. But we should also give the young generation uh, the tools they need to rise to their own occasion and then do the two at the same time. Mm-hmm. So at, I think that cops are, I personally feel it's a critical thing for us all to talk to each other and share all this information, but let's get our language right. We have a hundred percent fabulous world to live in and we can do this. And so every time you see these solutions coming, uh, for nature-based solutions, for example, I, I think a friend of mine, Carlos Duarte, a marine scientist, said something the other day that struck me. He said, you know, the ultimate nature-based solution to climate change are humans. We're nature. Let's get some solutions. So it's, it's, it's not just planting trees or whatever. It's also a spirit of engaging with the biosphere in a way that's delightful and, and fecund. And so every time you see one of these, quote, nature-based solutions, it's nature has a way of just being beautiful all the time. It, Can you give us a, an example or two, Bill, of, of a nature-based solution that you think is exciting and working well? Well, first we're doing an inventory of all the things around the world that say produce you know, oxygen, absorb carbon, that kind of thing. So good. But when you really look at some of these seagrass areas, like in the, in the Atlantic, you, you, it's truly mind-boggling how beautiful they are. Trees are beautiful. Even something as prosaic as a pebbled beach is beautiful. It may not be capturing carbon per se, but it's beautiful. A little kid goes to a beach and we all become Andy Goldsworthy. You know, we sit, get down on our knees and start piling up little rocks and we take some home because they're beautiful pebbles. If you go to a gravel quarry, you don't get down on your knees and sharp rocks and start collecting stuff that you think is cool. And so nature has this way of being beautiful. And so the nature-based solutions, the ones that regenerate the soils and bring back the fecundity and celebrate the water and, and so on are always quite something. And even in the fisheries, when you see people preserving certain areas and they become 
to come again. It's not only is it highly uh, advantageous for economics and for other things, it's also beautiful. So I think nature-based solutions are your first place we're gonna look for all these various solutions. But this problem is so great. We must come up with other ways to take carbon out of the atmosphere as well. Mm -hmm. It'll be technological solutions. And they're they're tricky right now. They're, you know, they aren't, they don't look too natural. So uh, I think we're we're looking at how many ways we can capture carbon just in our daily lives. So I like to design buildings like trees, you know, use renewable power, purify water, invite other species, you know, preserve biospheres. And so. What other species are you inviting into the <laughs> to the building? Well, we start by looking, you know, you can look up in the air and see what birds fly overhead. Mm -hmm. I say, let's worry about them because this is theirs too. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then we look at the water and see if we have benthic invertebrates or whatever's going on in the air and say, this is all part of an ecosystem. And the surest way to heal an ecosystem suffering from ill health is to connect it to more of itself. Because if you destroy an ecosystem, you can't get back. But if you have a, something left, it can heal. Mm -hmm. We must preserve. And then, and then also enhance the ability of these systems to recover. And this, that's first. Yeah. An organization um, that uh, I've been working with a little bit is uh, that works on sort of reforestation and bringing trees back to help improve microclimate, carbon sequestration, biodiversity, et cetera. As you're talking about, one of the interesting things they're finding is how many companies have a lot of degraded land on their balance sheet, which they do nothing with. Right. That just it just sits there. And so there's an opportunity to identify with those companies, all those real estate holdings that are just, um, you know, sallow, but but in a in a way that doesn't sort of um, they, they've been destroyed from a nature based perspective. And there's an opportunity for regeneration and actually generating benefits um, there but with those companies, just like completely paid, not paid any attention to any of that land as an example, right? So there, I think there's huge opportunities along the lines you've described. Um, I wanted to um, ask you to talk more about circularity. And I know you have a few slides to help us understand your thinking on this. Um, you know, you've, you've been a pioneer in this space. You you were doing circular before circular was cool, <laughs> and um, and now are you know helping us make sure that we uh, continue to develop circular approaches in a way that is um, uh, you know positive. Um, so I'm wondering if you can talk to us a bit about you know how you began your um, insights, your work in cradle to cradle and circularity, and then maybe show us some of your your thinking um, through the through the slides that you have. I think that first, the, uh, people often ask where this comes from. And for me, I was born in Japan in 1951 after the Second World War. And my parents spoke Japanese. And they were, my father was a Japanese language officer for MacArthur's. And they, they were part of the occupation. And they, they went out with civilian clothing, no weapons, no marked jeeps, no uniforms, no paperwork. And my mother and father were two of those trained to do this, 200 couples trained. And they went out and made peace. And, uh, and they just started making friends. And so I remember thinking, oh, this is nice, you know, a little kid. And so everybody's friendly. And, and then I started to see images from the war, Hiroshima. Uh, bombed out buildings in Tokyo. And I, I remember thinking, oh, how, why do people do this to each other? How's that possible? But at the same time, we lived in a traditional Japanese house and we would listen to the ox hearts come in at night with the food from the farms and they would clean out our latrines, the farmers, and take it out. They called it the night soil. And so I always saw this idea of our, our waste became food. So I always thought the cities and the country were one thing. I still do. So as we talk about increasing urbanism, I also think about what is agro-urbanism. So it's got, you, can't, you have to connect the city to food, for example, you have to. So this idea of having food close by and more the, the move to the local is so critical. 
Mm-hmm. And it's an ancient, obviously, an ancient, obviously ancient thing. I mean, the villages in Europe were the yeah. distance apart was farmers getting back to the village at night and bringing food in and out. So, so I, that's where it meant a lot to me. Mm-hmm. And then, and then I went to Hong Kong where we had refugees and and semi uh, desert, and we only had four hours of water every fourth day during the dry season. So you were careful. But my summers were spent in the Puget Sound, uh, which is heaven. I bet. Kid, you know, John trees and whatnot. So I saw this abundance and then I saw the scarcity and I saw design because the Japanese, you can't be in Japan without thinking about design. And the Japanese are very sophisticated in design. They even talk about what they call the ma, which is the space between things as part of the design. So I remember my mother teaching me. She was doing ikebana, flower arranging. And I said, Mommy, those beautiful flowers. She said, yes, and look at the space between the flowers. That's what I'm designing. And I was like, oh, you know, oh. So yeah, that's where I sort of started. And then I, when I was in architecture school at Yale, we had the, we had the energy crisis. And I started designing a solar house for Ireland, where my ancestors come from. I wanted to see what it would be like to become, in a sense, ancient and imagine building a house that could be warm and comfortable and not burn anything. So I started working on that and I built it myself by hand, an experiment, and I enjoyed it very much. And I, but I just started there. And then when the energy crisis hit, I, I remember being in my studio and the professor, a famous one, walked by and he goes, what are you doing? And I said, I'm designing a solar house for Ireland. He said, young man, solar energy has nothing to do with architecture. I was like, whoa, you know, not according to Vitruvius. So uh, it didn't make any sense to me. So I just kept going. And then we did the first green office for the Environmental Defense Fund in the early 80s in New York. And uh, and I won a couple of competitions and designed a building for Poland, a skyscraper. And I told the developer, you have to plant 10 square miles of trees for it um, because five square miles to offset the carbon to build it and five square miles for the carbon emitted in its operation because they make power with coal. And it was so strange, the Wall Street Journal put it on front page I said what is that and here we are 33 years later still having these conversations right <laughs> seemed obvious at the time <laughs> but yeah i think a big turning point for me too was meeting michael brungard in 1991 he's a chemist very sophisticated in these matters and uh so we started working together and then wrote the book mm-hmm. and, I just keep going. Now, now we've got the circular carbon economy, which I think is right because the circular economy describes its you know climate relationship as we reduced our emissions. But the question is just like that engine, like why emissions? Not just I reduced my emissions. Like what if I didn't have emissions like that? Mm-hmm. So that's why we look so carefully at renewable power and. So it's high proficiency things, but uh, the 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 notion that carbon is both a material and a fuel, and I can show you diagrams to see that was really fundamental for me. And that was 2020 mm-hmm. in Davos. I was meeting with the energy minister of Saudi Arabia. We were talking about carbon, and then it just there it was. To it's like, wait a minute, we're talking about both a material and a fuel at the same time. Mm-hmm. So there's carbon in buildings as durable carbon, right? There's carbon in polymers, as single-use polymers, or as durable-use polymers, and there's fugitive carbon, plastic in the oceans, durable carbon in the wrong place, fugitive, and and atmospheric carbon is now clearly. Uh, in the wrong place. <laughs> wrong. Yeah. So, I mean, a toxin is often defined as a material in the wrong place at the wrong dose, the wrong duration. 
Mm-hmm. So water can be highly toxic, as Michael will point out, because you know if if I if you surround yourself with it for six minutes, you're dry, you're dead, mm-hmm. toxic. If you jump out of an airplane over the ocean and hit the ocean at terminal velocity, oops. So it's the wrong dose, wrong duration, in that case, very short, and, and has a terminal effect. So, you know, the, everything has to be looked at in the context of how we're engaging with it. Mm-hmm. So, so it wanna... uh, Sorry, do you, do you want to show us a couple of sure. slides? Yeah. Sure. I think Celeste, if you could show the circular, uh, the uh, cradle to cradle diagram, and then we can look at that evolve into circular economy. Thanks. So in cradle to cradle, we proposed see the world as a biosphere and a tectosphere. Biosphere is natural things; they can go back to nature. They can call these products of consumption. You can consume them. Toothpaste. Right. Then on the right side, the tectosphere are materials designed for human utility and purpose. We see these as products as a service. So we took that idea and coined it into the circular economy this way, not just, you know, this everything is this way, but technical materials that are being used are really a service. They're washing your clothes. They're, you know, taking a picture. They're getting you from place to place. That's the service you're looking for. And so a lot of cases, like a washing machine, you don't need to own a washing machine. Uh, you need to get clean clothes. So over time, we're seeing people catch on to this, that you, what you want is clean clothes. But if you think about it, the materials, the rubber, the aluminum, the steel, and so on, can all still belong to the manufacturers because it's their raw materials. And so they can come and get them back when you're done. And there's a whole way of setting up business relationships. A good example would be what we did with Shaw Carpet, where we designed the carpets with Shaw to be reusable, not PVC being a problem, but thermoplastic polyolefins and, and caprolactam based nylon six. So that you're storing your raw materials on your customer's floors. And so your relationship with the customer is perpetuated and the materials are being reused and used and used again because it's an optimized system. So what you're really getting is, this, is the comfort on the floor and the appearance and acoustics and all those things but you're not getting all the rest of the stuff you didn't ask for. So it's good. And so that was cradle to cradle. Then we have the next step is to put them together. And so in China, starting in the late 90s, I started working on the circular economy. And then you realize that it's these two spheres of influence and they're being engaged together and they run together. And that's the circular economy. So things start to recirculate, hopefully in the right places. And that way we can increase the size of the economy because we're using things again. And the important thing is not to be designing for native use, it's designing for next use, but also we want an economy to grow. And if I can use it over and over again, it keeps growing because it's still there. And I, I like to point out to people often they say you know we're running out of resources and it's like no we're not we're running out of sources nature doesn't have resources nature has sources it's our job to turn them into resources so we're running out of sources not resources so let's get in and start designing resources and that's the circular economy like that so then from there, we can see we can have a growing economy. Isn't that nice? And we've hit a very interesting and solemn moment in, in the history of the planet. A year and a half ago in nature, uh, they, uh, well, it's two years ago now, they, they pointed out, scientists pointed out that the dry mass of the technosphere, the objects made by humans, the infrastructure, the buildings, the cameras, this monitor, all that is larger than the dry mass, you know, its weight of the entire biosphere. So human-made objects are bigger than nature in the sense of biological material. It's truly astonishing. Mm-hmm. So the technosphere is now larger than life itself. 
well. So as designers, what does that mean for us? And so that's why restore the biosphere for sure and get that technosphere so that we're reusing things. And that I like buildings like trees, they absorb carbon, they produce oxygen. So my, somebody asked me what my thoughts were after Glasgow. And I said, I just keep thinking, what do you tell the children? So I said, here, think about it this way, emissions. Oxygen is for emitting. Think like a tree. You don't want zero emissions of oxygen. You're confusing everybody, zero emissions. We want positive emissions of oxygen. We want carbon is for sequestering in the tree or in the soil and so on. And not, you know, getting from the atmosphere and building humus. It's interesting to notice that humus is the root word of the word human. And humility means to be grounded. They all come from the root of soil. Isn't that beautiful? That so, is beautiful. Yeah. I hadn't thought of that. Yeah. Yeah. The language, see, it helps you mm -hmm. with these things. And then, and so just think about that. And then hydrogen is H2O and carbon, you know, life. Um, hydrogen is for oxidizing. So we can use the hydrogen, even from CH4, from methane. Let's, let's get that hydrogen, use it for thermal loads and things like that. And then uh, let's take the carbon and make it into a durable. So graphene, other materials that don't go to the atmosphere. So think of hydrocarbons as hydrogen carbon instead of fuel. Right? Think of the hydrogen if you want as fuel, fine. But the carbon, think of it as a durable good or a healthy soil, that, that kind of thing. So it's kind of exciting. So that's why we created circular carbon economy. There it is. And we added to reduce, reuse, recycle, we added remove. So we have to get carbon out of the atmosphere. It's not just enough to be more efficient. Because if we're doing the wrong thing more efficiently, we are, we're using Six Sigma, we become perfectly wrong. So what we want to do is become fabulous. So, so the diagram shows that there's the regenerative biosphere full of living carbon. And we celebrate that. And we can recarbonize. So we keep talking about decarbonizing. That's ridiculous. We want to decarbonize the atmosphere, not decarbonize yourself. You are carbon. So we want to recarbonize the soil, not decarbonize everything. So we got to get our language straight. Let's decarbonize the atmosphere. Let's recarbonize the soil. So it becomes clear. So there on the left is the bias here on the right is the technosphere. And that thing in the middle that causes the circular economy to run was guess what? Hydrocarbons coming from the geosphere on their way to the atmosphere at very high speed, whoops. So we have to cut that in half by 2030 on emissions. Essential, this is not negotiable. This we must do. And then if we're going to achieve 1.5, and we must achieve 1.5. This isn't, you know, vague thing. 1.5, it's not, it, they put two originally, you know, 1.5 to two, forget the two, 1.5. Let's go there. And then we keep going. So then we'll take out more as we go. But on the technical side, we have to figure out a cool new thing that can remove carbon from the atmosphere and, and stabilize it, and use it and recarbonize our production. So on that last, last point, what do you see as the most interesting innovations and opportunities there? Well, clearly we now have renewable power where we want it at very low cost. So we have solar energy coming in now. And in some places it looks like it might be as low as one cent per kilowatt hour next year. That's astonishing. So in places like deserts and things like that, we can get really inexpensive solar power, of course, and then use that as a regenerative resource. So that's, that's a good one. It's a big one. The, the, on the carbon capturing, I'm working on one right now uh, with a university and an industry that is uh, various kinds of concrete for the future. Since it's our infrastructure, it was like a tree, wouldn't that be great? So it's not just, can we stick some carbon from a coal-fired plant chimney 
into some concrete and do that. That's a very noble thing to do. But can we do something else that even more that absorbs massive amounts of carbon? Mm -hmm. uh, just because we're, we're caring about it. And that's why I don't have a problem with net zero because it's a license to, to the young people, get at it. You know, it, you're not blocking it. You're just saying, good, let's go there. So they don't have to sit there and say they don't want to do anything. Sure, let's go to net zero, but let's get onto this creative side of that equation, which is, can't we go more than that? Is that all? 2050, why does it take so long? Mm -hmm. Net zero, yeah, let's go net positive. If I can get to zero, just to add another kilowatt hour and do another few things, but guess what? I, the world got better because I'm here, let's go. So I think that's the exciting part of all this is that once you realize that zero is nothing, let's get to work on something. And that mm -hmm. something needs to be fabulous. Mm -hmm. So that's the fun part. And you're starting to see it. I mean, who, who would have thought that we'd have electric cars coming so fast at us? And then we have to worry about the cobalt and all there's so many things to concern ourselves with. But um, that's important. And remember when Kennedy said we're going to the moon in 10 years, you never got to see it, but I did NASA space station on Earth, uh, sustainability base, Mountain View. And working with the NASA folks, it was fantastic. And they reminded me that the moonshot, they put Neil Armstrong on the moon in nine years. And when they tell you that, they point out that we had a schedule that when Kennedy said we're going to the moon in 10 years, that when Neil Armstrong stepped on the moon, the average age of the engineering team was 28. Wow. That means that those half of that team were in high school when Kennedy said we're going to the moon. They didn't know we couldn't do it. And they just did it. So I think let's give the young people a challenge. Like, yeah, 2050? Yeah. Why is it going to take that long? push, mm -hmm. dream, you know, share. We need to share. And as you pointed out earlier, it, to keep it to 1.5, um, you know, anything that gets us to two, three, you know, the, the exponential and negative impacts are huge. So we need to be thinking very ambitiously and aggressively and acting and aggressively. Yeah, um, and fast. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you had uh, mentioned sort of the net positive concept. I think you might have a slide on that. I don't know if you want to show that or just to explain more how you're thinking about net positive, because that's a term that's bandied about a bit. Um, and then maybe um, I see some excellent questions, so we can maybe turn to those from the audience. Well, we, we, uh, we started talking about net positive a long time ago. And so I'm excited about that. And we, we have a chart we use at MBC for the chemistries and we use it in our design firms. So it essentially says, let's take an inventory of our choices. So the red stuff is no, don't want to do that. The, that's the, use the engine over again and burn gas, no. Then the green stuff is like, oh yeah, that, that's a good trajectory, let's go there. So that's your inventory first. So gasoline power car, yeah, let's see if we can do something other. Uh, then instead of looking at, do you have the chart from before this, Celeste? Can we show the, the now the, uh, the positive negative charts? It's Sorry, important. I don't have those up. Oh, okay. Well, see, see, most of the time people put that red stuff going from tall on the left and down to the right, like business people. And so it's going down to zero. There's your net zero goal. And okay. But then you're telling the kids, you know, it's, you're making my life tough because I have to feed and clothe you and I can't be zero. And then at the top, if the red is on the top, is, oh, I'm going to reduce my emissions by 25% in four years. So you just told the next generation what you're not going to do. So that's like telling a taxi driver, quick, I'm not going to the airport. It's very, it's information, yes. But it's not that interesting, right? We didn't, still don't know where we're going. So that we take that red stuff and put under the line and say, this is what we don't want. We've decided, no, that we'll call that bad. That's a human value. 
And then we're going to put dimension to it because we like numbers and we like to prove you know, data and we like value as well as values. So there you'd say, these are the things I don't want. And then on top, you say, let's put the things we do want. And what you discover, you do them both at the same time and you go as fast as you can. And what's happening is you're going from a degenerative linear economy to a regenerative and circular economy. And you go shooting through net zero and out to the top. So the goal of that chart is on the top right, not in the middle and not at the bottom. Mm -hmm. okay? So it's just an easier way to see it. I'm going to do that. Thank you very much. Excellent. Thank you so much, Bill. I really appreciate your um, whirlwind tour. I think really helpful to me and to the rest of the um, audience. So I have a lot of good questions for you. I'm going to start with one from one of our MBAs um, who's asking, where are MBAs most needed in the circular economy space? Where do you recommend we look for jobs if we have good general management and critical, critical thinking skills, but minimal technical sustainability experience? Because oftentimes you know, students coming out of business school don't have that technical experience, but they've got a lot of good strategic business skills. So what, what are your suggestions for that, Bill? Um, I don't know. Where are you? I'm looking for that all the time. There's so many things to do. Um, I think the job of someone who's got an MBA is to say, I have all these skills now. Uh, and now what do I, what do I see that would give me great, uh, comfort and delight to do? So I think a key part of this is to follow your bliss. As Joseph Campbell would say, yeah. Do something meaningful. So, and you, the technology will follow the intention. So find out what your intentions are. And, and remember, we're going to be sharing a lot of these things too. The idea of hegemony and ownership, you know, has driven the markets and capitalism, but there's something that's happened. I remember meeting with a head of an investment bank and saying, you know, what's your secret of Wall Street? And he said, the creation of the perception of scarcity where none exists. Whoa, you know, everybody rushing to get something because of the fear of missing out, or, you know, it's scarce. That's not scarce. Um, we had lots of opportunities. So what's happened now is I think we don't need just the question of modern capitalism, which is, how much can I get for how little I give? We need to shift it to how much can we give for all that we get? So there's still this accrual of benefit and growth and joy, like watching a child grow up. But it's not mean. It's not just minimization, avoidance, and reduction. It's optimization, engagement, and thriving. See? So that's, that becomes an economic question. So if you can put your skills into that kind of system, it would be very helpful. So thanks, and, thanks and, Bill. And just, and just to add to that, I, I would say, um, you know, there's a number of companies, startups and others that where circularity is a big part of what they're doing, um, whether it's, um, you know, looking at, at fashion and reuse or a variety of other uh, expressions of circularity. And there's also, I would say, within existing companies, really beginning to look at how you can drive reuse of your prod, of your kind of waste um, streams for operational efficiency. All those things are ways in which MBAs can sort of help bring your, the lens you're, you're describing in terms of thinking about circularity to whatever it is they're doing, right? In any um, company or operation or any role, really, you can bring these um, uh, ideas and concepts to to work. Would Would you agree with that? I agree, definitely. Yeah, yeah. excellent. All right, good. Um, let's see. Moving on. So we have a question around global food waste. Um, so produced um, in the production of food, um, there's a lot of negative impacts of all the waste, food insecurity, water use, greenhouse gas emissions, etc. Um, they're asking, um, what innovations in the food waste area are exciting to you? What, what would you um, highlight? 
Well, I know in Korea or in Asia, um, you know, they, they have they've had farming for 40 centuries. Okay, so you know, 4,000 years of farming, same piece of dirt. That's amazing. So when you look at what they understood about nutrient cycles in soil, you get stuff returned. So I think for our cities, for example, now, with 80% of the population being cities, the Koreans have developed small composting. They're not really composting, they're desiccating machines that shred your food waste in your kitchen, you know, this big. And then it turns it into a powder that looks like coffee. As high in nitrogen, it's not composted, it's just desiccated, it's just dry powder. But now how do we return that to the farmers? That's interesting. So we're starting to see companies that are working on things like this. And, and then you look at a sewage treatment plant, and instead of calling it a sewage treatment plant, you call it a nutrient management system. And all of a sudden you look at it and say, what's in that liquid? And you discover all these things that are amazing and all these things that are delightful and all these things that are not so delightful. You know, as you see the drugs and the various things that, that we could come out of medicine or hormones and whatnot. But those are nutrient systems, actually. So some other cities are finding ways to take out phosphate from there very elegantly and a 12% economic return. Well, compare that to having to send ships to Algeria to mine phosphate right there, it's in your city. So they can sell that to the farmers nearby, agro-urbanism. So those kinds of things, food waste. The, the French had a system called uh, Circular Intelligence, which was circular intelligence. And the farmers around Paris, with uh, gardens, market gardens, espalier fruit on walls facing south, and all the and things like that, they would bring in all the, the verdure and the vegetables and the produce in their carts. And then they would collect on the way out. They would collect the horse manure from all the systems and all that kind of stuff and take it back out to the farms. So circular intelligence. So I think that we can evolve into that kind of thing. And for food waste, certainly, um, because it is a terrifying thing. We have you know, something like 35% of the food is wasted and that's sad. Very sad, particularly when many people around the world don't have enough food. That's right. Yeah. So, but, you know, we can, I think we should be building soils with carbon as part of the regenerative agenda and the carbon reduction, the atmosphere agenda, and then helping make sure we do that in places where people have food that they need. Mm -hmm. So it, it, try and link it all back together, connect it to more of itself. Great. Excellent. Thank you. Um, I have a question around... Um, integrative design. So the question is, um, in talking about hyper-efficiency, where do you see Amerly Levin's work on integrative design fitting in? He often talks about the backwards impacts of efficiency. In other words, reconfiguring pipes for reduced friction means smaller motors to handle pumping, which means less energy demand, so potentially fewer central power plants, et cetera. Um, and then uh, she also mentions John Warner and Paul Anastas work on green chemistry shifting the circular technosphere into the regenerative biosphere. Any thoughts that you have around these various lines of thinking? Yeah, well, that's, that's it is, uh, they're wonderful. And the idea of efficiency is clearly uh, a productive agenda. But what, what I, I think we've also seen is that to be efficient, as Peter Drucker pointed out, is a manager's job is to do something the right way. And let's say the right way to do something would be to make it efficient. So you have less, you know, less waste, less energy, less whatever. That makes sense. But it's the executive's job to do the right thing. So then you give it to the managers to do the right way. So if you looked at it and said, we can have hyper efficiency, and, you know, at the time there was discussion about hyper-efficient cars. And so you get 90 miles a gallon and you make it out of epoxy and carbon fiber. Okay. But now you just made a 25 year vehicle that will burn fossil fuels efficiently. 
Is it better than one that doesn't? Yes. Is it what we really need? Yeah. For now, transition. Okay. But it's what it's really sending a signal of what we what we might want to think about further. Because it's, it's hard to recycle carbon fiber with epoxy and internal combustion engine. So it's all important and it's all good. And it is often the low hanging fruit for sure. Cause it's already got money attached to it. And so if we can make that better, but for the business school students, I should just point out, I got to meet at um, W. Edwards Deming before he passed away. And Deming had brought total quality management to Japan and Toyota famously adopted it and it's very productive for them. A lot of people don't know, but the way Deming got onto that stuff was he was in the war, Second World War. He was, a, he was a statistician working in factories and he was recording the difference between the women in the factories making stuff and the men who went off to war. And that's what he was tracking. And he discovered the women outperformed the men by real numbers. And it turned out they didn't have inspections. They all considered themselves inspectors. They wouldn't make a non-perfect product. They wouldn't make a shell, you know, for a, for a cannon that would blow up in their husband's faces in the field. So they just started sitting in circles, talking to each other, making sure they didn't do anything, wasn't just right. And they sent it back. Like anybody could stop the line. They shared jobs. They, you know, just like that. And when the men came back, he went to the war department and said, you won't believe what the women did in these factories. And, and they said, well, that's nice. We're hierarchical, we're inspection based. And we just won the war, so go away. So he did, he went to Japan and uh, the rest is history. So thank you women for your instruction. And uh, what, what I was looking at is it was effective. It wasn't, they weren't trying to be efficient. They were saying, how many can I do on quota? You know, reject 20 at the end of 200, you know. They weren't gonna have any rejects. Mm -hmm. So it was about being effective, doing the right thing. Mm -hmm. That's an important message and lesson. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, so another question we have is really about how to get your philosophy and ideas out there. So the uh, question is, how would you like to see your philosophy promoted in the media so the critical mass of humanity learns about, learns how much is possible? The public can't demand what it doesn't know it can have. I'm thinking of the power of Hollywood to champion what's possible, wondering what your thoughts are. Thanks for all you continue to do. Oh, well, that's kind. Um, I don't really know, just, I mean, for me, Leibniz is the philosopher, basically led Voltaire to write about Pangloss in Candide, which is the person running around saying, this is the best of all possible worlds. And when you stop and think about that, is this the best of all possible worlds? I think for designers and people in commerce and so on, let's start to think about what would be the best of all possible ones? And then you start to think, well, it's not just that it, it's possible, because the thing about designers is we think, if it's possible, we already think it exists because we put it in our heads to create it. So I think when you talk about what's possible, my job, I think, is to make it exist. Then it is possible. Because if people can see it and go, wow, look at this giant green roof at Ford Motor Company. And look at these carpets that are going back and forth to the customers with safe materials. And look at this. And they're economically driven and they're viable on a very rich agenda, um, which is now sort of trying to be understood as ESG. But if you, if you look at that, um, I think success success so do it and succeed it's hard yes but it's imperative so, so the, the last que question on that um sort of in terms of what will make it easier to succeed um we have a question around the business case so they're asking what business cases for circular practices have you noticed that have been most successful for companies especially companies that are sort of on the beginning of their journey 
to consider adopting? Are large companies willing to make these investments or are they waiting for startups to make the first moves to then acquire them? So maybe if you have some thoughts on that, but also any examples you could share. Often, again, language. Uh, I was so proud of Ford Motor Company when we had a chance to work on the River Rouge under Bill Ford. And, you know, he said, we have this factory, it's going to be built and open on our 100th birthday, the day can't change, the budget can't change, there it's going to be, what do you think we could do? And we decided to try to do the world's largest green roof so that we could start producing oxygen and cleaning water and providing habitat and so on. And also cleaning soil with phytoremediation from the first industrial revolution and let plants take up the toxins and so on. And it was brave. And, but when we found the language for it, it was after it looks kind of loopy, the roofing industry said, oh, it's impossible. So we went, all right, well, you're talking to people who sell bitumen and plastic. Of course it's impossible because we need to talk to botanists. So you, you, like you were saying earlier, it's like, where do you start? We well, may start outside your profession. You have to start with a botanist if you're going to talk about that kind of thing. So we found a botanist who was doing a green roofs in Germany, Eastern Germany during the Cold War. And it was, um, it was camouflage for MiG fighter jets. Interesting. Right? And so we adopted that and used that here. But the great thing was it saved for millions and millions of dollars over conventional engineering because the landscape was purifying all the water instead of three chemical treatment plants and lots of auto workers standing around waiting for big pumps to go on. So it turned out to be quite valuable. And if you think about it, if you saved $35 million in CapEx using nature instead of equipment, well, if the Ford Taurus is at a 4% margin on Chicago, that would be the equivalent of an order for $900 million worth of cars. Whoa. So you talk the language of cars and money. It's an automotive company. Mm -hmm. You don't talk about this project for the birds, which is true, because that's not going to get you approved. You know? But if you come in and say, oh, yeah, it's like getting an order for $900 million of cars. Oh, well, then we can consider this. Yeah. And, then, and we can be brave because we're... We're not just wandering around. We're we're directed and we're deliberate and we're making wise investments. So I think that's the key to the whole thing is everybody learn the language that's necessary to execute. Wonderful, Bill. I really appreciate you taking the time to talk to us, and and more importantly, just the inspiration that you prov you provide now and have over the years past and the years to come uh, to help us all think about. Um, how we can make this world a better place, a regenerative and a positive place, um, and, and also for your tutelage on the language. <laughs> so thank you again. Really appreciate okay. your time. Thank you. And we will send out to everybody the link uh, to your book. Um, and uh, um, I hope everybody... It's just, a little, um, it's just a little booklet for portfolio. Yeah. yeah. Perfect. Great. Thank you so much, Bill. Take care.